You're about to hear a true story that's full of heart, hope, and transformation. It involves drug use, mental health, and crime. There are moments that are difficult to listen to, but they were a lot more difficult for the people who lived them. You probably didn't press play looking for a story about pain and suffering, but like every story we share on Tell Me What Happened, this one features a stranger stepping in to save someone in trouble. Justin Downey is about to have one of the worst conversations of his life. He's a year into a three-year prison sentence. This time, Justin's in for illegal possession of guns. Where the payphone was is right next to this mop closet, and the cord is long enough where you can hide kind of in the mop closet if you were going to have a conversation. Justin's calling his aunt. And she said, I got something to talk to you about. I said, what's up? And she said, uh... They took custody of the children. My daughter and my stepson um, were, you know, put into, taken into state custody. My aunt tells me this on the phone. She also tells him that his baby daughter is in custody too. She'll be adopted by another family. And uh, I remember that I, I broke down crying in a really, really um, inconsolable way. And I tucked myself into the into the closet so nobody would see me. Three weeks later, Justin's aunt dies of a heroin overdose. The losses send Justin over the edge. He ends up in solitary confinement for months. I had to really sit with myself and look at the fact that uh, not only did um, my, my criminal mentality and my drug addiction and everything else harm me, but it had trickled down into harming the most pure and innocent thing that I've ever loved in my life. This story is about making amends for the harm you've caused. It's about building yourself back up through community and purpose, with the help of a stranger who helps you find all of that. I'm Tora Kachur. And this is Tell Me What Happened, True Stories of People Helping People, an original podcast by OnStar. Every day when you wake up, you don't know if you'll be a person who needs help or if you'll be a person that helps someone else. It's important to remember that it's in all of us to be either one of those things every day. Justin grew up in the South Boston neighborhood of Dorchester. My grandparents raised me because my mother was a drug addict. And my father did a lot of real damage growing up to me. Uh, Terrible human being. Still, Justin grew up in a big family. His mom was the oldest of seven. And his aunts and his uncles lived with his grandparents too. The neighborhood was run by the infamous crime boss, Whitey Bulger. We were kind of groomed in this shadow of a legendary figure in our neighborhood that basically created an entire generation of young men that all their whole life ambition was to be gangsters and and criminals. Including Justin. His uncles took him along when they broke into houses and stole cars. By age 12, Justin was robbing people and snorting cocaine. And then heroin swept through his neighborhood. He remembers the first time he tried it. I just felt that that warm euphoria just went right through my body. And instantaneously, it, it's, it was like being wrapped in like a warm blanket. And this is what stuck out to me. All pain, physical, emotional, mental, trauma, everything just immediately just wiped away, you know? Heroin feels like love. When he was 18, Justin's mom died of HIV AIDS. He needed to dull the pain even more. His drug habit got worse. Justin started selling cocaine and heroin. Then he went to prison for robbing a bank. When he got out, he went right back to his old ways. And that led him straight back to prison this time in Portland, Maine, a town where he had no connections. But Justin believed it's what he needed. I was relieved. 
I knew that I couldn't stop using drugs. I knew that I needed to go away, but the next three and a half years was very difficult. It was in this prison that Justin had that phone call with his aunt when he learned he lost custody of his kids and broke down. Justin ended up in solitary confinement. He had lots of time to think about his past and his future. I had become something that I didn't want to be, you know? I didn't want to be a drug addict. I didn't want to be a criminal. I didn't want to be an absentee father. I didn't want to be a damaging parent. In the months that followed, Justin also lost his uncle and his grandmother. I got turned inside out in that cell, and this war kind of initiated inside of me. I couldn't stop crying. I was homicidal, suicidal. I was fighting the cops. I was lashing out. I was getting put in restraints all the time and beaten on and maced. And uh, I just went berserk. And I just wanted to die. Then one day, a switch flipped. And I remember going up to my sink and throwing water on my face and looking in the mirror and seeing my reflection. And this thought came into my head. If you don't work, I mean, really put some work in and change these character flaws, not only are you going to die, but your daughter is never going to know who her father was, never going to know who her mother was. I said, I'm never coming back to jail. And I have to build myself into a version of me that I don't even know yet basically, God, take my life or change my life. Justin still had two years left on his sentence. He spent this time working out and reading books on philosophy, psychology, and spirituality. When he got out, he needed a place to live, somewhere in Portland. He found a bed at a sober house, a group home for people recovering from addiction. And I go to this community and everybody's trying to heal and get well and talking about how they feel. And I felt like a fucking alien. It took some time for Justin to adjust. And it took some time to find work, too. He applied at local construction companies. When he did get an interview, they do a background check. And they don't hire you. You leave there, and everything the prison tells you about yourself, you believe. You, you feel like you're not worth being in society, that society doesn't care about you, doesn't love you, doesn't want you, that you are broken and throwaway and garbage and all that. This stuff starts really becoming a reality inside of you. Weeks passed, and Justin couldn't find work. Then, someone from the sober house suggested he try a place called Mainworks. Why don't you go check out Mainworks down the street because... um, that's what this woman does is hire convicted felons. And, um, you know, so I was like, all right, I'll try there tomorrow. I mean, luckily I got lucky because I met Margo, right? This is Tell Me What Happened, a podcast created by OnStar to showcase how important a human connection is when you need help. Justin was born into a life where drugs and crime were the norm. In 2014, he went to prison, but with two years left on his sentence, he decided to turn his life around. When he got out, he was clean, but struggling to find work. He needed help. 60% of the time, people get out of jail and they get rearrested within the first two months. That's Margot Walsh. She's the founder of a company called Mainworks. She only hires people recovering from substance use disorder and people with felony convictions. If you come to Mainworks and stay for two weeks, your chances of getting rearrested drop to about 30%. And that same statistic applies to recovery and ability to stay clean. Margot has very personal reasons for wanting to help. She's a recovering alcoholic who started drinking when she was 15. We would go to these pit parties or power line parties, as they were called, in the middle of nowhere with bonfire or small campfire. And everyone would kind of sit around the tailgate and drink. And it made me feel like kind of the king of the world. 
Margot's drinking got worse after she graduated from college. But it didn't stop her from getting a job as a recruiter for a large investment banking firm. She loved the job, and she was good at it. But she also loved the lifestyle. I used to travel around the country all by myself and drank on planes and drank in hotel bars and drank out of the mini bar, and I loved it. I, I loved it. I was hungover every day. So drank to the point where I was hungover every day and would go to work with like the most devastating hangovers, but I always worked through it. And I had this unbelievable, uncanny ability to keep it all looking good on the outside. She was trapped in a vicious cycle. Guilt, shame, and remorse. Guilt, shame, and remorse. And I can't wait to get more. Do it again, do it again. Guilt, shame, and remorse. Margot's addiction took over. She cashed out her 401k and sold all of her savings bonds. Then, in December 1997, everything came to a head. Margot lived with her husband and her two-year-old son in Connecticut. They planned to drive up to Maine for Christmas and spend the holidays with family. But first, they stopped at a friend's house. And things got out of hand. The most drunk I've ever been, probably. It's enough to say it was a morally terrible scene. My husband packed up and was leaving. And I said, what am I supposed to do? And he said, I don't care what you're doing, but you're not coming with us. So that night I dragged out the phone book and I found AA and I called. Because I obviously wasn't going to be able to sustain this anymore. Margot's dad drove her to a rehab center in Maine the next day. And it was like so dismal. And you go up and down to like AA meetings wearing your bathrobe. Like this is the first year that your son is kind of aware of Santa supposed to be coming and mom is in rehab. I mean, it's like a sad country song. Margot took a sick leave from her job. The month she spent in rehab changed her. For the first time in your life, you meet people that you can be completely honest with and who have the ability to say, me too, which is what are the most liberating words you can hear from someone. When she got out, she kept going to counseling and joined group meetings every day. Marco didn't want to leave Maine. She wanted to be closer to her father, her AA meetings, and the sober relationship she'd built there. So she left her job in Connecticut moved, and started over. I was the one who was desperate to start to give back in some way or be of value because my self-worth had been reduced to sort of ashes by the time I got sober. Margot volunteered at a local jail. She learned about a program where inmates worked at a donut shop across the street from the prison. And that's when Margot's background in recruitment kicked in. So I thought, would you guys like to do construction work? Because there was a brand new bridge project going up. And then the minimum wage for that, for laborers on the bridge, was like $15 an hour, which was a ton back then when the minimum wage was ten fifty an hour. Margot asked the sheriff at the jail if she could set up a better work opportunity for the inmates. And he said, no one hires felons. It's just a thing. It's like accepted. And so that gave me even further like reason to want to do it. So... I thought, okay, well, if no one will hire them, I will. I'll start a company that would include them and predicate my whole business model on employment for felons, where they could have a better sense of self-worth at the end of the day. And the guys that I hired, as it turns out, were mostly incarcerated for drug and alcohol-related behavior. In 2010... She funded her payroll with a $2,000 bank loan and $8,000 from family and friends. There was a big demand for laborers in Maine at the time, and the jobs came rolling in. But Margot quickly learned that helping former felons and addicts find work was one thing. Helping them show up for work and stay on the job was another challenge completely. So another day labor staffing company, like Rent-A-Guy type of place, they don't have any real way to steward what's happening during the day, but it became my, like, obsession. 
So I went, checked on them all the time at the job site, asked them what they needed, you know, what, what kind of outerwear do they need? And I bring them every day and bring them home at night in my minivan. And that's literally how it started. Margot's efforts really paid off. Within two years, Mainwork's revenue was $250,000. By 2015, it hit $1.6 million. A year later, Margot was named Maine Small Business Person of the Year. She wanted to give back to her community. This early success proved she was making a difference. The biggest gift in life is to be able to help people or be a facilitator so people can find themselves. I always say, you know, the, the person that you want to be is in there already. You just don't know it. And then, in 2017, she met Justin. Oh my gosh. Justin, he's covered in tattoos. He's just a tough guy with a wicked Southie accent. And you would probably want to just cross the road and say, I'm not dealing with that guy. Mago kind of reminded me of all these, like, in a good way, of all these, like, fiery, crazy, intense Irish mothers that I grew up around in Boston, right? Margo knew there was more to Justin than his tough guy appearance the first day they met. I went into her office and I walked in and I sat down and we got about four words in and I just ruptured and uh I just broke down crying I, I, I couldn't I couldn't stop crying for a number of minutes and it was like hysterical type crying and this is the first time I meet this lady and my body just broke open Justin shared that he had to give up a child to state custody while incarcerated and I've never seen anyone you know in that emotionally uh, bankrupt moment. That's like a death of a child. And I remember his head and hands, and there's a there's a Van Gogh painting of an old man. It's called Despairing Man. It's a painting that Van Gogh did of an old man clutching the side of his head on a tiny little chair. That's what it looked like to me. It was unbelievable. She just consoled me. You know, she didn't get wide-eyed. She didn't freeze. She didn't do any, any, any of the things that you know, a lot of people would do. She just sat with me and she just listened and uh, she told me to come back the next day. Margot put Justin to work on a road crew, jackhammering concrete and cement. He was also responsible for cleaning the site. You know, I was a guy that was, you know, used to making a certain amount of money and then I'd get this job at Margot and I was getting $12 a fucking hour to sweep floors, right? But I was content. I didn't have to watch over my shoulder. I could have, I would have swept those floors on construction sites all day long. The work was good, but Margot made sure the guys got more. She created opportunities for them to feel human. Good to see you. I'm so happy you're here. To feel like they were a part of something. Every morning before shifts started, the crews gathered around a fire pit in the main works parking lot. So they would go around, first and last name, where are you from? Pretty ingenious because a lot of the guys are coming out of prison. You know, they're used to their last name and a serial number. They're not used to even being addressed as a human. And then that became one thing that you wished that you had did when you were little. Or what's one thing you've never done? And, you know, your day is getting started with warmth and community and connection and purpose. It's like the Island of Misfit Toys, Main Works in the Morning. Myself included, of course, because these are people who are totally disenfranchised. They don't know anyone. And I remember that feeling from my own rehab, getting out and being like, I felt like I was on Mars. You know, if anybody needs help, what do you guys need help with? We're here to help. But it became like the ethos of the organization was that circle. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. Justin was still recovering, processing. It's very hard to describe how noisy your inner world gets when you come out of jail. And like the trauma of my life was was playing out in my body and my mind on a daily basis. The loss, the grief, the loss of self. And sometimes it would boil over at work. Margot could see the darkness he was going through. All I could think of is, please, Justin, please don't hurt anybody. One day... Justin got into an argument with a coworker. I felt everything contract, my muscles, everything just kind of got f- swelled up and 
felt like my back perch up and uh, my arms, everything got tight. And my body was going into preparation. But uh, I stepped out of the room. And I had to catch my breath. And uh, I just remember thinking, I can't let this lady down. And I don't want to bring any heat on to what she's doing because a lot of other people count on this. I kind of just stepped back into the room. And I ended up apologizing to the guy for snapping back at him, you know. Sometimes life got overwhelming and Justin wouldn't show up for work. And a few months after starting at Mainworks, things took a turn for the worse. I just remember him coming in and saying, you know, I, I, I re- I'm out, I relapsed, I'm, I got kicked out of my house. I was like getting high sneakily after, you know, after work and stuff like that. And yeah, I had somebody die on me. The man Justin was getting high with overdosed and died in front of him. I don't think he felt like he could go on because he was witness to that so up close. And in that moment of despair, knowing how badly he'd messed up, Justin turned to Margot, but he wasn't sure how she would respond. Margot, um, she didn't, she didn't like tell me I had to leave or anything like that. And I just told him what I tell everybody, which is you need to get, start back from square one and get get to meetings. And do you need treatment? Do you need detox? She was just like, I'm glad you're all right. This was a turning point for Justin. Something got burnt down inside my obsession to use drugs, you know. And I knew after that, knew instinctively, just knew that I was done with drugs and I I was done with crime. I was done with going to jail. Margot helped Justin find and pay for a room in a different sober house. She bought him food and clothes. And she connected him with a trauma counselor. The more time Justin spent at Mainworks, the more he opened up to Margot. Justin came in all the time. And I loved it. It's just him looking for some, like, anchor. We would have a lot of one-on-one conversation there in the mornings, and I would just talk to her. I'd just open up about, you know, not just my life, just life in general, just conversation. He has a raven tattoo on his neck, and I was like, what's up with that? Like, I think I have a comfort level with these guys that I don't feel afraid of anybody. So I was like, what the hell is that? He's like, just egging him on, because he's never been egged on in his life. And it's not it's not disrespectful. It's just out of pure fun and love. Just love, unconditional, we've got you. You trust me, I'm not going to do anything to hurt you. And you're okay, you're safe here. That's what it is. I knew he was getting better because he started to care about himself. He started exercising and explored his spirituality. Justin is now a certified yoga and meditation teacher and is studying to be a trauma practitioner. I noticed that he started to fall in love with himself, which is so important that's the last frontier. He really wanted to be Justin, which was not the case when I first met him. I feel like I have to know a completely different person in the last seven, eight years inside of myself and things that I didn't even know about myself. In 2019, Justin moved back to Boston. He'd found work as a welder. The work he'd done on himself with the help of Margot, had paid off. He made a point of saying goodbye to her. Just, like, went and sat down, had a hot to hot with her, thanked her, and um, she just gave me a big hug. Like, Margot gives really, really good hugs. They're big ones, and she kind of squeezes you. She just made it very, very obvious that just because I'm leaving doesn't mean that I don't have a home there. Recently, Margot invited Justin to speak at a Mainworks dinner. Justin brought his kids. I've been able to restore my relationships with my children. I have my daughter lives with me now. Um, so I've been able to restore a lot with the children that I, that I have. When I saw Justin sitting at the head of the table with his children, sort of leaning back in a chair with this huge, like, sense of fulfillment. I couldn't even believe it was physically true that that would happen. And there it was. 
But Justin still doesn't have contact with his youngest daughter, the baby who was adopted while he was in prison. It's something that keeps him moving forward. I have to build myself into a version of me that I don't even know yet, that when my daughter does get reunited with me, she needs to not understand why she was even taken away from me in the first place. That's how much self-work I have to do. I have to make it so I'm unrecognizable. For a lot of young people in recovery, Justin's a role model because he has those years of experience. So he's lived a really hard life, and I think it's, he's an incredible power of example. And he's come out of it with wisdom. And I think that's what everybody at Mainworks represents. They are the sum of all of their parts. And like Justin, who was, in my opinion, not likely to succeed, given the trailer full of baggage that he had. And here he is. Like, he's, he's really the inside-out person, like, metaphorically speaking, flipped himself from the inside out. It's cool. I never would have made it if it wasn't for her. I wouldn't have made it. There's no liberation from addiction without community, you know? Recovery isn't sobriety. Recovery is connection. It's connection with others. That's how we're restored to, to wholeness. Over 46 million Americans over the age of 12 have a substance use disorder. For many of them, finding the community and the support that Justin found with Margot and Mainworks, that's very rare. Nancy Dauphiné is a licensed mental health counselor and addiction professional. She's the chief operating officer for David Lawrence Centers for Behavioral Health in Florida. She says it's important to be able to spot the signs of substance use disorder early. So substance use can be really tricky and sneaky, and it can look very different depending on what substances an individual is using. So in general, when you start noticing disturbances in sleep, and that can be sleeping too much or not enough, or perhaps weight gain or weight loss, sudden changes in mood, irritable, wild mood swings, differences than what a person's normal kind of baseline behavior has been. These are going to be issues that are a concern. It might look like problems at school or at work um, where there previously weren't problems, you know, grades or attendance or getting in fights or arguments. And then also a big one can be money issues, sudden money issues, um, requests for money that are unusual or being caught in lying or deceit in a different way than maybe before. These are all things that we start to see as a pattern. And when your gut tells you that something's not right, usually that that sixth sense um, is on to something. The story we just heard is about two people who started using substances really early in life, 12, 15. What advice do you have for parents or, or caregivers who are concerned about the young adults in their lives? I think it's really important to start early to build relationship and rapport with your child so that you do get a sense for what's going on and you can have open communication when you are noticing changes to try to explore those issues further. And also sometimes it's important as a parent to rely on other sources of information. So sometimes maybe it's your child's friends that are raising a concern or it's a teacher or a coach or someone that's seeing your child in another environment uh, where some of the tension between parents and teens aren't quite as heightened that they might see a concern or you could ask about those concerns. You know, the best case scenario is that there's not a substance use issue going on, but um, important to investigate it if you're worried about something. So how do you start that conversation? One of the important things is to suspend judgment around the behavior that you want to explore. Try to set aside the worry and fear and have a non-judgmental, open conversation about what your child or any loved one might be uh, exposed to or experiencing. So it's important to recognize that today's drugs are different than what they might have been like when we were teens. And so not go in with that scared straight approach right away, but rather to come in with an 
open, curious stance to say, hey, you know, I've been hearing about this on the news. Are you seeing this when you go out? Or what are your, some of your friends, you know, what are they seeing? And open conversation without judgment, without um, a punitive stance, uh, because that will stop any conversation before it even starts. What about taking care of yourself? How important is that when you're trying to help someone else? The first thing that we can do to help a loved one who has a substance use issue is to stay as healthy as possible. When you love someone with a substance use issue or even just as a parent dealing with a child who's experimenting or engaging in risk-taking behavior, it can be exhausting, it can be overwhelming, and it can be very isolating. It's important to take care of yourself first. And that's not being selfish. That's actually the best way to help your loved one. Because if you're not well yourself, they're not going to be able to lean on you when they need you. And you need to be in it for a long haul, the long haul, because this is this is a marathon for most most cases, not a sprint. I'm thinking about the worst case scenario here, but how can you prepare yourself to help someone who's overdosed? It is easier than ever to get free Narcan and Naloxone to have on hand in case you encounter somebody who may be overdosing. It's becoming unfortunately more common. So we have started putting Narcan kits in our first aid kits, keeping them at home, in your car, keeping them wherever you would have a first aid kit. You just open it and it has the instructions there so it won't hurt someone if they're not overdosing. You can be doing this while you're waiting for EMS. This is in no way to replace calling emergency 911, getting trained paramedics on scene. But in the meantime, this can save someone's life. Well, Nancy, thank you. Thank you for your work and thank you for giving us hope. Thank you. That's it for this episode of OnStar's Tell Me What Happened, true stories of people helping people. If you want to share your own story about a stranger who showed up for you at just the right moment, look for a link at OnStar.com. Or if you're listening on Spotify, check out the Q&A feature. Let's share some love for people who help others in big ways and small. While you're at it, share some love for this podcast. It really helps if you review and rate us or share this with someone who would enjoy it. On behalf of OnStar, I'm Tora Couture. Please be safe out there.